gold trails and ghost towns. Share the adventures of our early pioneers as we explore the development of the Pacific Northwest and beyond with your host, Mike Roberts, and historian, Bill Barley. Welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. I'm Mike Roberts. With me, Bill Barley, our storyteller, raconteur, prospector-type friend. Today, we're going to talk about the most famous woman in the Gold Rush days. Would that be the best way to describe yeah, her? I, I think so. We're talking about Klondike Kate uh, Rockwell, who was, uh, I think, compared to all the other people who came out of that fascinating part of western North America, the Yukon District, was by far and away the most well-known individual. So what we have to know is the Klondike, 1898, yep. of course. Well, 96, actually the rush started in. Yeah. 96, 97, a few people were in Dawson. They were engaging in this type of diggings, and this shows an old shot of, of Gold Bottom, Mike. What he, is Gold Bottom? Well, Gold Bottom is one of the creeks where where Henderson really first made the discovery, which led to the discoveries in Bonanza and so on. And uh, this shows the type of diggings they had in the early days, shallow diggings with the miners able to handle with a pick and shovel. And the gold was really quite staggering. Yeah. And then you have an early view of Dawson. This is probably... These this are two is, little kids sitting on that log. They're children. Yeah. So that everybody went to Dawson. Oh, sure they did. Sure they did. But mostly men, mostly yeah. men. Few women, but mostly men. And this shows Dawson, it shows uh, Front Street in, in, in its original uh, idea, and then Hospital Hill there. Yeah. Now, and these guys are rocking gold, this bunch here. Uh, yeah. It looks like a leisurely kind of work, you know, just sort of uh, yeah. sitting back and rocking. Well, you had to save water, so rocking was the easiest way to do it. And, Mike, it was it, the ground was so rich, and we mentioned that years ago on this. The ground in, in, in the Klondike or the Yukon was... I think probably the best ground in the world, with a possible exception of some ground in Russia, which we don't know much about. Yeah, but the, they, they were hauling gold sure. by the ton out of here. And they got in the difficult way, Mike. Most of them came in over either the Chilkoot Pass and the Chilkoot, and this is a famous shot from the Chilkoot, shows a string of men in an, in an unending line going up the Chilkoot, then going on to Lake Bennett, then down through Miles Canyon and into, into Dawson itself. The other pass was White Pass? And the other pass? pass is White Pass, and here shows White Pass, and not many people on the trail, but it shows the difficulties they had to do to get over it. Yeah. And then when they got right into White Pass, this shows a few mules, surprisingly enough, carrying hay for some horses that are, that are working, uh, working the, the, the trails. And a lot of those horses died, of course. And into this environment of 30,000 prospectors oh, yeah. and maybe a few children uh, comes Klondike Kate. Comes Klondike Kate, and she is really in a class by herself, Mike. All righty, we'll talk about Klondike Kate as Gold Trails continues. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. We're talking about the Klondike today. We're talking about the most famous woman in the Klondike, Klondike Kate. But yeah. before we do that, I mean... This era, this place generated nothing but p persons who were bigger than life. Oh, yeah. You had Whitewater Bill Gates. There's an example, you know. A wild, wild man of, of the Yukon had been a stern wheeler captain at one time, was a high-stakes gambler. Uh, Maiden lost a number of fortunes, followed by the direct opposite, Silent Sam Bonifield, who had the bank saloon. High-stakes gambler, eventually, gambler eventually blew his brains out, yeah. Now, he, uh, he actually had... Uh, you, you've been trying to get an artifact of yeah. his. Yeah, he had hundred... Maybe that's bad for me to bring this up. The yeah, price just true. went up. Yeah, it did go up. Uh, he, he had $100 uh, poker chips made out of ivory and carved, you know, individually. And I can probably get one from an old friend of mine in Victoria. He has two. But the price, as a thanks, Mike, has probably gone up. <laughs> and, uh, but there are others. The, the yep. Lion of the North was Sam Steele, the Northwest Mounted Police uh, there. commander there. Um, William Ogilvy, whom I think the, the Dominion government surveyor surveyed all the claims on the creeks, and the most honest man in the Yukon, by far. Not much doubt about it. So you had all sorts of Lords of the Klondike, uh, Big Alex McDonald, who, who made a multi, multi, multi-million dollar fortune, died broke. So um, you had a lot of fascinating characters. Them and 29,995 more. Yeah. So where did Klondike Kate get her start? Uh, she obviously just didn't show up instantly. Yeah. Well, that's true. She was, she was born as Kathleen Rockwell, uh, born in Kansas. And uh, her mother, we don't know much about her original father. We really don't know. 
and there's not much revealed about it, but she, her mother marries a judge, a very, very famous judge in, in, in that Kansas territory. They come up to Spokane, which is the Inland Empire, and she has all the, all the, uh, the, the possibilities a young woman could, could, could want. She has a, a cook and she has a governess and there's a, there's a, there's a, a doorman and there's a, you know, she has everything. She has a private school. The silver uh, spoon is lodged firmly yeah, in her mouth. Yeah, and she's very, uh, she's very good looking for her age, very headstrong, Mike. Uh, kind of a gold, uh, blonde, gold, um, red hair, kind of a mix in there. Yeah. Violet eyes, they say. Whether or not that's true, I don't know. But if something happens, of course. They're living in the lap of luxury. Her mother and her stepfather divorced, although he was very fond of Kathleen. And he, but he's very, very generous in the settlement. But the mother gets $65,000. She doesn't handle money well at all. She goes around the world on a tour, takes Kathleen with her. Kathleen falls in and out of love at 15 years old, which is not unusual at that age, I guess. And, um, and the mother comes back. Finally, she comes back. She's dead broke. Not a penny left. Now, $65,000 equates to about $2.5 million today. And only took a few months to get rid of it. So she doesn't handle money too well. She ends up in New York in the garment district. So she is actually... So she's in a, in a sweatshop? She's in a sweatshop like, in the garment district. Well, and this that's is where not she stays. A, th Kate obviously doesn't like this bit at all. Well, no, but she's cut loose now from her mother because yeah. she has no option. So Kate goes in, answers an ad in a newspaper, becomes a chorus line girl. And that leads to a come-on girl. Now, don't, don't confuse that. A come-on girl is a girl who simply dances with men and, uh, and she entices them to have a drink. And if she, they take a $5 bottle of wine, she gets a quarter of that. She would get a dollar and a quarter. And so she, she breaks into a troupe and the troop then travels over the, towards the northwest of, of, of British North America and, and, and America itself. So that's Victoria, Vancouver, and Seattle. They end up in Seattle with this troop, and, um, and they do quite well, actually, in Seattle. And then they hear about a magnificent, absolutely magnificent gold rush coming out of the Klondike or the Yukon Territory. And most people call it the Klondike. And the Argonauts start landing in both in San Francisco and in Seattle. And they make such a hit in Seattle that it turns Seattle right around. This, this is a shot of uh, a warehouse or a storefront selling provisions sure. for the gold fields. Yeah, and most of those provisions are bags of flour. You know, that's the staple. You live on flour and <laughs> flour straight, they used to say sometimes, Mike. <laughs> and, and of course, this attracts, and there soon is a city established in, in this territory, and that's called Dawson City, which yeah. is, you know, very, very important part of the, of the whole picture. So they start gravitating north, and they go into, into Lake Bennett. And Lake Bennett is, is uh, sort of the kind first of the, stop on route yeah, to Dawson. Yeah, one the of the major stops on the route to Dawson. They build the boats there. So they come into Lake Bennett, and here's, here's a couple of shots of, of the area as it looked in that day. This is the bank, the Eternal Bank, the Bank sure. of Nova Scotia. Merchants no, Bank of, Merchants uh, Bank of Halifax, right. Mike. Merchants Bank of Halifax. And the right the wrong town. That's right. It was, it was incorporated with the Bank of Commerce, I think, in 1921, if I remember correctly. And so anyway, so this is gold dust. They're gathering gold dust. Here's a Main Street shot on Lake Bennett before they're taking off for Dawson City. And all the people are gathered there. They're roping them off. They're getting ready for a 100-yard or 50-yard dash, Mike. Sure. Anything to pass right. the time and uh, right. get a little wager going, and yeah. that's the kind of town it was. Precisely. And this is the canyon they go through. This is Miles Canyon. And this is, this is a, a kind of a relatively calm part of the canyon. People who ran that canyon, they didn't allow women to run the canyon. She ran the canyon in men's clothes. The Northwest Mounted Police monitored everybody going down. They didn't recognize she was a woman or didn't want to. I don't know. And she finally makes it down, and she comes straight in past Laustown, which is what they call Klondike City, and the other side of the, uh, the river from Dawson. And that's where people who didn't, couldn't afford Dawson went to. Laustown. Laustown. That is the yeah. most uh, horrible name you can... I mean, it's... it's well, it isn't complimentary, It's not right? complimentary. No, it isn't complimentary. <laughs> but then you get into Dawson, and Dawson itself is, is kind of interesting. You know, I mean... You, the streets are absolutely shoulder to shoulder with miners and, and, and gamblers and businessmen from all parts of North America. They're gravitating. Remember, this was just at the end of a depression. Yeah. So this kind of turns things around. And Dawson City, of course, is one of the great recipients. And, I mean, this shot here shows the, the boats lined up on the shore. Yeah. The town is, is booming and sure. bustling. Yeah. Uh, the stern wheelers are, I mean, well, we already mentioned a couple yeah. of stern wheeler captains. They were gung-ho. Yeah. Oh, sure they were. And downtown Front Street was Dawson's uh, sort of main attraction. Sure. 
Sure. And uh, so Front Street, is. this is how it would have looked. And this was the main street in Dawson. If you examine all the photos that come out of Dawson. And remember, this is a big, big town. This is a glittering capital of the, of the northern part of the world. There's yeah. really nothing can touch it, Mike. And here's some of the creeks, you see. Here's, here's one of the creeks. And this is probably, I think, uh, Bonanza Creek. And Bonanza That's Creek is... That's the cabin is, 20 above. So yeah. that was 20 above where the gold was first yeah. found? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so then these guys are all going to be working at sure. that claim. Sure. And this next one is uh, how many below? That's uh, 12 below. 12 below? That's 12 below in Bonanza. And the other one's 20 above, I think, on Dominion Creek. Yeah. But this is how the claims would have looked, taken at the time by the various photographers in Dawson City. And there were a number of them, Mike, yeah. a lot of different photographers. So into this environment walks uh, Kate Rockwell, who's not yet attained her... Uh, her reputation as Klondike Kate. No, she's one of a number of dancers who come into Dawson City. And, you know, uh, she came in on, a, on the arm of a guy who was kind of interesting, a guy called Alex Pantages. And the Pantages family are still in Vancouver. Very the well. Pantages Theater. I, That's I've right. Heard of that. sure. He became a, a theater mogul. But he wasn't at the time. He was a young Greek Im immigrant, great deal of charm. Uh, women were attracted mm -hmm. to him. At this time, too, that Kate Rockwell was, was actually engaged to a guy called Danny Allman. And Danny Allman had been uh, in a minstrel troupe back in New York State, and they were engaged, and he was coming up to see her. Unfortunately, he stops in Vancouver, catches some, some plague or some, something that, that causes his demise immediately, overnight. And waiting for, of course, is, is Alex Pantages. And uh, he, with his, with his ability to, to promote, promotes her in in, in a grand style, and now, she, she becomes... she is a, a figure unto herself, as you already pointed out, quite, quite uh, beautiful, oh, yeah. uh, quite statuesque, and she makes her mark in oh. this place. Oh, indeed she does. She dances on the stage of the, old, of the old Orpheum, and this is a shot of the Orpheum. Doesn't look very grand by today's standards, but in Dawson City, that was something. And you look up and around the floor of the Orpheum, and this is a masquerade ball, but you can see these, these various boxes up there. And these were where the people who could really afford to, uh, to uh, sit in the boxes and watch the show down below. So what does she do? She's a dance hall girl? Yeah, she's, she's a dance hall girl. She sings songs. And, uh, and this is a uh, kind of a full shot of one of, her, one of her costumes that she would have worn. And this may have been taken by Pantages. I can't trace it down. Quite possibly it was. She's about 18 years old at this time. And she has some competition, Mike. Yeah. Uh, she has Diamond Tooth Gertie. Uh, she has Gussie. Diamond Tooth Gertie. You yeah. can't go too quickly over these. They're yeah. wonderful names. Yeah. Well, Diamond Tooth Gertie was known of that because she had a, a diamond right set in one of her front teeth, which made her quite quite unusual, but really didn't come up to the class of of, uh, of Kate Rockwell. Now, I mean, what do you pay stars like her in these days? Well, let's let's look at the wages, Mike. Wages were about um, for a good miner up there. Um, just a few dollars a day varied how good the mine was. Uh, in, in, the, in the United States, stateside, or Canada, uh, you would get about $1.50 a day. She was making about $30,000 a year. You do your old multiplication times 40, and you've got one point Two million. Two million dollars yeah. a year she's yeah. making. Yeah, staggering. And that's just base salary, I take it. That's right. And she and Pantages, according to her memoirs, were going to get married and they were partners, equal partners and so on. And that, that may indeed be the case. I won't question that. And uh, so she, she makes all sorts of money and she makes it by unusual ways. She does no, she's no longer a come on girl, but when she dances and when she sings, and remember, this is a woman who stopped traffic in Dawson City. When she walked down the street, Men just stood and looked at her, first of all, because there weren't many women in Dawson City at that time. There were some, but not many. And she was so striking with, the, with her kind of her red, gold, blonde hair. And uh, also, they, uh, they tended to throw their hats in the air and cheer when she came by. Now, this, this would kind of turn their head a little bit if you're a young I, I, woman. I would be impressed. I would uh, begin uh, to strut if that 19. was the... No, it's, I mean, she... Uh, a, uh, uh, a woman of ill repute, or was she had a good reputation here? No, I, I think she, uh, she, she, there's probably not much doubt that, that she and Pantages were lovers, but, but she had a good reputation. She was not uh, from the, the back streets of, of Dawson, so that um, 
So she was. So she these was, people actually, the miners really must have held her in esteem. Oh sure, she was the first pinup girl in that area, which is interesting, you know, because they had pinup girls in the 1890s and 1900s, not so much anymore. But but certainly she was one of them. She must have attracted some devotees. Oh, of course she did. And what happened? Of course, she had all sorts of ways to get extra money. They'd throw when she sang and when she danced, they would throw nuggets onto the stage. The occasional careless or drunk miner would throw a whole would throw a whole bunch of gold onto it in the, in the form of a gold poke, which is a leather sack containing gold. That was hers once it hit the stage. And she would wander around <laughs> circulating with the miners at the various tables after. Not as a come on girl, but she would have a bracelet which would have, uh, we'll say, four or five double eagles in it, Mike, which is a $20 gold piece. Yeah. But one of the places would be empty. It'd be vacant. Somebody said, oh, my dear, you've, you've missed that. And they'd, they'd put a $20 gold piece in there. She'd also have a belt on. This was common yeah. with, the, with, the, with the dance hall queens. They would have a belt there with $20 gold pieces. I want to show you a $20 gold piece. I mean, this, this is just, this, oh, don't drop it, it'll bruise. <laughs> now, these are, these are gold pieces. Yeah, and this is, this is what would be in her belt? This would be in her belt. She would probably have 20 of those in her belt. Look at that. And she would have one of them missing, or perhaps two, yeah. one on either side, so they couldn't see the other side, you see. Yeah. And they would, she would get these replaced each night. Well, isn't that a spectacular yeah. find? I can't find the belt. Love to find one for my collection. Can, any, so you can I'm find the gold so. anywhere, but you can't yeah. find the belt. So what happens, Mike, is Dawson is a glittering, glittering part of the North for about three years. But finally, just after the turn of the century, it starts to slip. And it does start to slip, I think, rather, rather significantly. So they decide that they will look for other, for other pastures and right. better pastures, Mike. Okay. Let's take a break here. Be back in just a second to continue. Listen to this. Makes such a lovely sound, doesn't it? We'll continue our discussion of uh, Klondike Kate right after these words. Don't go away. better than ordinary bandages. It's dry. Welcome back to Gold Trails. As we were saying, the uh, digging started to get a little thin on the surface, but uh, that's why they had one of these buckets around, yeah. Bill. This is for high-grade ore? High-grade... Well, high-grade... Uh, gravel? Gravel, actually. Yeah. Ore is different. And what, they, what happened is they'd put this in the bottom of the shaft when they were on bedrock, break up the bedrock, Mike, with yeah. a pick and a sh shovel and so on, and shovel it and then whisk it in to make sure all that gold that, si that sifts down into the, into the crevices and cracks in bedrock is in here and not outside. That's why. To That's make why sure it's, it's like, a dust, like a dustbin and Precisely. it would be gold dust that they're chasing. Gold dustbin. And why the size? Because gold was too heavy and to make it bigger would be bad? Or were they working in cramped quarters when they started? They were working in pretty cramped quarters in many instances. Sometimes they had to crawl out. Depends. That was per permafrost, too, though, Mike. So. Well, that, these pictures that we're looking at right here, this yeah. is, uh, these are photos of the deep operation. Yeah. How, what are they having to do now? Well, this one on Dominion Creek means they have to go down. The shaft may go down 60 or 70 feet. They're in permafrost, and the, the old shallow diggings are gone. So you can see they're using less, fewer miners. The price uh, they're paying the miners has gone from $10 a day down to $5 a day. And uh, the next one, which is on Bonanza Creek, which was one of the great creeks of the, of the Yukon, is the same sort of operation. They're now going to, you know, you can see all the, all the apparatus there, fewer miners on the surface, some yeah. down below, and this is what was happening. So the, the vast bulk of the miners were disappearing from Dawson, and the result was Dawson was going downhill. Who notices this right off the mark? Yeah. Well, it's our friend Alex Pantages. He's very, very sharp. He's got to move. With him goes Klondike Kate. And where and they, do they head to? Where, well, what's, they, the, what's there? Because there's not another gold rush to go to at this stage uh, of the game. They head to an, an old city which had treated them quite well, Seattle. But they part company there. She thinks temporarily. I guess he doesn't. He starts a theater there with a vaudeville show. She goes to Victoria and buys a little theater for $350, sells it for $1,500, is going back to join him when she finds out that he has married a vaudeville uh, uh, girl, uh, which was in his, uh, in his theater. Now, uh, she's had uh, several broken hearts. I yeah. mean, remember that way back when, when she was 16, there was yeah. a broken heart, another yeah. broken heart from the almond guy. Yeah. I mean, is she used to broken hearts? Well, this was a real broken heart. This was, I, when you read her, her memoirs, this was the one that really did break her heart. So she goes back to Dawson, hoping to recoup. She comes back to Dawson. Now, here's what the Monte Carlo looked like in 1899. It's heyday. That's right. Hopping. Crowds on the streets. Dawson is booming. She comes back to this Dawson, and this is the Dawson of 1904, 1905. 
And then not this, many this, people on the street. Well, tonight. this is an interesting shot anyway because this is at midnight on the 1st of July. That's right. This is the midnight sun sure, happening here. Sure, but there's still any other year in 1899-1900 it would have been packed. So she has to leave Dawson and her fortunes go downhill from there. She goes back to Seattle, stakes her mother. Her mother actually launches a very successful real estate business. She goes off to a little place called Bend, Oregon and takes $3,500. All she's got left, Mike, that's all she's got in the world. Pawns her jewelry, pawns her gold. And this is after she was making yeah. 30000 a year plus all the gold nuggets and sure. gold double sure. eagles that she could carry. So she's down on her luck, no doubt about it. But she marries a young guy called Floyd Warner. And Floyd Warner is quite a few years younger, probably in his 20s. She's in her 30s when she marries him. This doesn't last long. And uh, after World War I, she married him in 1914. After World War I, he goes his own separate way. She goes her own way and tries a number of, number of different businesses. And despite her, her protestations to the opposite, she probably doesn't do very well. She goes to a meeting of the sourdoughs of the Yukon in 1931. And they, and they, this is to commemorate her, really. This is, this is their salute. She's sort of the to, guest speaker oh, in this one, is yeah, this right? she's not the guest speaker. She is the guest. Yeah. There's a difference. Right. And uh, so this is Klondike Kate. They're all o a lot older now. It's 45 years or 40-odd years since they were in the Klondike. She's a lot older. She's in her 60s. And somebody reads the account of this in a, in a, in a creek way up on the Klondike. And his name is Johnny Matson. Johnny Matson's an old Norwegian that had fallen in love with Klondike Kate Rockwell in about 1899. He was one of the people in the audience, and he, maybe through a double eagle. He was not in the audience. No? He read about it way up in the Yukon. He's 150 miles out in the, out in the creek in the he Yukon. He never got on to Madison see the creek. show. Oh, yeah. He never got there. He didn't take time out. And he reads about Klondike Kate, and he writes her a letter and says he wants to marry her. And she remembered this little Norwegian looking at her many, many years ago when she was the belle of, of, of Dawson City. So she actually meets him in Canada. And they, they decide to get married. And they do marry. They go to back, to the, back to the Yukon. She goes down the then deserted streets of, of Dawson and goes back in the, uh, in the Savoy, which was the one of the places she danced at, and it's totally empty. And she's left there with her memories. Then she goes back, and they spend some time together. She goes back to the States, lives in Bend, Oregon. He comes down and sees her, or she goes up once every year. Both of them are quite elderly by now. And finally, you know, uh, she gets some recognition in her, in her old, old age, Mike, and finally passes on, and I think it was 1954, early 1950s. What an amazing story. I yeah. mean, uh, now, has she written her story? Is there a memoir? You said her in her memoirs. Is there yeah. A, is... yeah, there are many accounts of, of Klondike Kate, and some of them are at variance to each other. So you have to be very, very careful. I think she... Sh she shaded her, her age occasionally here and there. Well, but as she, you're allowed to do, yeah, if, uh, you know, are, certainly, certainly there's a writer's license there. But, uh, you know, when you, when you read about all these fascinating characters, and of course Dawson City was that type of city. It drew those characters, as we mentioned before, and she was, I think, probably the most famous of them all. And there you go. Uh, with a broken heart from age 16 yeah. and uh, a world tour to start her off, her mother mm -hmm. taking her on this world tour. Yeah. And then Pantages and all the other and names. The Pantages family has done very well. That's a fascinating story. Yeah. And, she, and to think that it, it ended with her watching all of those places where all her greatest moments were, sure. uh, were just uh, ramshackled uh, ghost town places. Precisely. Klondike Kate, last name again, Rockwell. Rockwell. Any relation to the Rockwell of uh, rocket ship fame or anything uh, like this? No. No. Klondike Kate Rockwell. The story of her today on Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Join us again next time as we tell you more stories from uh, British Columbia, the Pacific Northwest, even to, to the Yukon's past. Bye-bye.